In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we thank you for this hour. Thank you for the privilege of being in your presence. Thank you for all your children here and in every other place we are connected together. We're asking, oh Lord, you enrich our lives with your word tonight in Jesus' name. Keep us awake. Keep us strong. Keep us victorious. Keep us focused. Let your power that makes conquerors of believers abide in every one of us in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down tonight. We are coming to an important subject. And it's an important subject of willingness. That's a great word. That's an important word. Willingness. You know, as we came into this world, the Lord did not consult with us as to whether we want to come to the world or not. So we couldn't have been willing or unwilling. The Lord did not consult with us as to who our parents will be. How dad and mom must be our parents. We had no choice. And so we cannot talk of being willing or not being willing. He didn't consult the country or the government of our country. Whether we should be born in this country or not, on that, that's not in our hand. Well, we're not consulted whether we're willing to be in this country or not. God made the choice. But now, after we came into this world, everything that happens to us affects our will, affects our decision. I have to be willing to live the way I'm living. I have to be willing. to make Christ my Savior. I have to be willing to make God my Heavenly Father. I have to be willing to walk in the path that he has laid before me to get to heaven. I have to be willing to live in heaven forever. Willingness comes after we come of age. When we are infants, we are told, go there, do this and do that. And we just did, but we came to the age of accountability, the age of reckoning, the age of understanding, the age of taking decisions. And then our willingness came in. And where you are today is because of your willingness. Have you been to school? Have you graduated? Because you are willing. Are you saved? Are you born again? Because you are willing. Are you abiding? Are you staying? Because you are willing. Have you come to this retreat? And are you staying through? And are you hearing the word of God? Because you are willing. Are you praying? And are you presenting requests before the Lord? Because you are willing. Do you want to be a giant, a champion, a conqueror in the Lord? Because you are willing, everything now, our victory, our success, our progress, our prosperity, and our spiritual stature now begins because of our willingness. Tonight, we're looking at our willingness for his resurrection power. Let's come to Psalm 1. 110. Psalm 110. I'm reading from verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That the Father, the Lord, saying unto Christ, the Lord, second Lord there, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. 
rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. That's still addressed to Christ. As a result of the victory of Christ, after he died, he was buried. After that, he rose again. And after that, he made the pronouncement proclamation. Because I live, he shall live. Because I overcame, ye shall overcome. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, because of that, verse 3 now, thy people, those who have become the people of God, after repentance and faith in Christ, those who have heard about the blood of the Lamb, that takes away all our sins. Those who have heard about his resurrection. And we're risen with him. Those who have heard about the justification. The, ju the power that comes as a result of the resurrection of Christ. And they plugged into that. And they received that. And they believed that. And then salvation and citizenship of the kingdom becomes theirs because of that faith in the risen Christ. Thy people, the people who are walking in the paths of righteousness. The pilgrims who are walking on the narrow path that leads to heaven. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Because he rose from the dead, he told his own disciples to tarry in Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. The day of his power is now seated on the right hand of majesty on high. And because he's over there, he has put down the Holy Ghost. Power has come. And he said, that power of the Holy Ghost will abide with his church forever. Now thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. He's saying that there's a renewal because of the day of his power. The dawn of his power. And because of the declaration of his power, now as we believe that, and we are attached and connected to that, now we can have the dew and the dawn and the freshness of youth. The Lord has sworn and will not repent, will not change his mind. That thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He said talking about Christ is now our high priest and is presenting a sacrifice. His blood right there in the presence of the almighty God for you, for me, for us. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with dead bodies of those who rebel against him, of those who fight against this Lord and God of glory. He shall wound the heads over many countries. And then he tells us, he shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. The whole psalm is talking about Christ. And he's talking about the people that come to connect with Christ by faith. And he calls them thy people and he says thy people the people of God in verse 3 shall be willing in the day of thy power in the beauties of holiness from the womb 
of the morning. And then he tells us, Thou hast the dew of thy youth. Tonight we are considering the message, our willingness for his resurrection power. A willingness for that resurrection power to touch your life, to turn your life around, to transform your life. Our willingness to receive and to have. A willingness to enjoy the endowment of power from on high because he rose from the dead. Our willingness for his resurrection power. The three things we're looking at as usual. Number one, the beginning of hope for God's willing people. The beginning of hope for God's willing people. It's resurrection, rising from the dead. And the great power and the glory and the majesty attached to that resurrection was the beginning of our hope. Hope in life, hope in eternity, hope at present, hope in the future, the beginning of hope for God's willing people. Number two, the beauties of holiness in God's willing people. As we come to Christ, the ugliness of sin is taken away. The ugliness of falling Adam is reversed. The ugliness of criminals is taken away. The ugliness that comes with sin and the ugliness that comes with sinning, all that is taken away. And now we have, because of that resurrection, because he rose up and because he ascended to heaven, now we have the beauties of holiness in God's willing people. Number three, the breakthrough of honesty by God's willing people. If there's anything that resurrection has done for us, if there is anything, the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ, and the ascension of Christ up to heaven. If there's anything that has done for us, it's that taking hypocrisy away. It has taken pretense away. It has taken hiding, because that was the nature of Adam after he fell. Adam, where are you? He didn't answer the question. I had your voice in the garden, and I'm hiding myself. Have you eaten of the tree, of the fruits? I told you not to eat. He didn't answer the question directly. The wife, the woman you gave me, gave me that fruit, and I ate. Indirectly, it's not my fault. Excuse making. Eve, what happened? What have you done? Actually, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. But because of the death of Christ, and because of the burial of Christ, and because of the resurrection that then cleanses us, that changes us, that wipes away all the traits of old Adam. Now, honesty comes because of that resurrection, the breakthrough of honesty by God's willing people. Number one, the beginning of hope for God's willing people. We're coming back to Psalm 110. And I'm reading from verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies the footstool. Number one enemy is Satan. And the prophecy is that Satan will bruise his heel. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. And that Christ... The seed of the woman will crush, will bruise, will knock out 
the head of that serpent that he is of the devil and so the enemy number one is the devil the enemy number two hidden nations hidden kings hidden leaders hidden people that say that christ will not rule over them he will bring all enemies to subjection and whoever is your enemy because you belong to christ has become the enemy of christ and all those enemies will be put down even from your life in jesus name the lord said unto my lord sit thou at my right hand until i the almighty god make thine enemies thy footstool the lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of zion rule thou in the midst of thine enemies the question we need to ask ourselves is how do we say that that refers to christ mark chapter 12 i'm reading from verse 35 mark chapter 12 reading from verse 35 so that you understand what we have read in psalm 110 it's applicable and actually it was made directly for christ mark chapter 12 verse 35 jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple how say the scribes that christ is the son of david how say the scribes those were the teachers of the jewish people in their synagogues and temples and our christ went to that temple he said how is it that the scribes are saying that christ is the son of david look at this for david himself said by the holy ghost the lord said unto my lord sit thou on my right hand till i make thine enemies thy footstool david therefore himself called him christ lord he called christ lord and where is he then a son and the common people had him gladly the common people who had been going to the synagogue who had been going to the temple they had heard those words of david but they never understood that the person david prophesied about through the inspiration and vision of the holy ghost that that person was right before them and when jesus opened their understanding that those things were said concerning him the common people were happy and they heard him gladly now you see what the father said sit on my right hand until i make thine enemies the footstool when did that take place look at acts chapter 2 verse 34 acts chapter 2 reading from verse 34 for david is not ascended into the heavens but he says himself the lord said unto my lord sit thou on my right hand verse 35 until i make thy foes thine enemies thy foes too you see he's quoted again and he said david was not talking about himself he was talking about jesus christ the very son of god hebrews chapter 1 hebrews chapter 1 reading from verse 3 in hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 who being the brightness of his glory talking about christ the brightness of the glory of god and the express image of his person and upholding all things 
by the word of his power. Look at this. When he had by himself purged our sins. That's Christ. When Christ had by himself purged our sins. Look at this. Look at this. Such down on the right hand of the majesty on high. That's after the resurrection. He died for our sins. He was buried. And then he rose again. And he rose triumphantly. And then after making infallible proofs of his resurrection to his own disciples, he was taken to heaven. He ascended to heaven. And he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. After he has shed his blood, paid the price, made himself the sacrifice to take away our sins. Look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. He didn't go to enter in those their synagogues and temples after his resurrection to appear in those places that are made with hands which are the figures of the truth. Look at this. But into heaven itself. He rose again. And he went to heaven. And he entered into heaven itself. Look at this. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. He rose again. After purging our sins. He rose again. After fulfilling the demands of the law of God. And because of his fulfilling that law of God, because of his saying, it is finished. And all that had to be done to sacrifice and to offer himself for salvation, everything had been done. And whosoever now will repent, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, salvation will come. And Christ has gone to the very presence of God for us. What's he doing there? He's making intercession for us. He's telling the Father that man believes in me. And because I was a substitute on the cross... I died the death he should have died. Pardon him, forgive him, save him, transform his life. It's appearing right now in the presence of God in heaven for us. And this person calls for sanctification and consecrates his life to the Lord. O oh Lord, touch my heart, purify my heart. Sanctify me, make me holy within and without. And Jesus said, Father, that's why I shed my blood, that the blood of the everlasting covenant will sanctify and purify him. Sanctify him, and so we're sanctified. Somebody comes to the Lord, he says, I am saved, I am sanctified. I need the baptism, the mansion, the endowment of power from on high. And he has gone to heaven, standing there for us, sitting down there for us. And he says, Father, that's why I came over here. I've done everything that needs to be done, that that from promise of power will be fulfilled. Answer him. And then we're answered and were filled, immersed, endued with power from on high. He has entered into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, I'm looking at verse 1 and verse 2. Wherefore, seeing we also... Are compassed about with so great 
a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight. Lay aside every weight. The soul was so important and precious to Christ that he died for you and is calling you because I've died for you. Now you can come and take the benefit of my sacrifice. Let no weight keep you down. Let no weight hold you back. You put aside, you lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily beset us. Peculiar sin for peculiar people. You would have noticed in your life that Satan doesn't tempt you with what doesn't concern you. Satan doesn't tempt you with what does not interest you. But something that you have been thinking about, something you have practiced in the past, something that in your days of the flesh, in your days before conversion, those things were the things that Satan used to pull you down. Always, always, always dragging you down. And those were the things that easily beset us. And he's saying now that we come to Christ. You lay them aside and let us run with patience. The race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. Look at this. The author and the finisher of our faith. Oh, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And he set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Set down at the right hand of the throne of God. God. I said that was the beginning of hope for God's willing people. Come to First Peter chapter 1 reading here from verse 3. First Peter chapter 1 reading from verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, look at this, look at this, has begotten us again unto a lively hope. Unto a lively hope. Unto an abiding hope. Unto the hope of living with God forever. We're begotten again. We're born again. Unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. By that resurrection, now we have hope. By that resurrection, now we have justification. Now by that resurrection, we know that nothing will hinder us if we make up our mind. Nothing will hinder us from getting to heaven. Did I hear an amen? amen? Look at Luke chapter 1, verses 74 and 75. Luke chapter 1, verses 74 and 75. That he will grant unto us that we be delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. You lost your amen there. Yeah. Let's make it personal. You know, when you read the Bible, if you read the Bible and see that's for us all, that's true, but you don't get any benefit from there because you think it's for us all. all. But when you know it is for me. If I were the only sinner in the world, Christ would still have died on the cross of Calvary. If I were the only sinner to be saved, the only sinner to pull out of the dungeon of sin and take to the heights of heaven. If I were the only one, Christ would still have died for me. If you were the only one, 
Only one sinner to be saved, to be pulled out. Of the dungeon and the well and the pit of sin, Christ was still have died for you. And so, make it personal. Look at verse 74. That he will grant unto me that I be delivered out of the hands of my enemies. Might serve him. Tell me somebody there. Tell me out loud. All your fears are taken away. Fear of man cleansed away. Away from your life and fear of your past all that is taken away from your life and fear of Satan will Satan allow me to finish my race he has no choice Satan is paralyzed will the evil spirits allow me to finish my race they have no choice all those evil spirits they are paralyzed and made impotent in Jesus' name. Verse 74, that he will grant unto me that I be delivered out of the hand of my enemies, might serve him, might serve him without fear. Fear is not something you struggle with. Fear is not something you are fighting with. And fear is not something you are crying about. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Fear. I don't want to fear. Christ has conquered all your fears in Jesus' name. Fear of the past. And fear of the present. And fear of the future. The Lord has conquered. Had everything for you. Fear of man, fear of woman, fear of failure. The Lord has cancelled, conquered everything for you. You will live your life victorious and fearless in Jesus name that he will grant unto us that we be delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him for how long tell me out aloud for how long all the days of our life. I'm asking you some questions now. Can you be holy for one day? I said, can you be holy for one day? How about for seven days of the week, can you be holy? How about times of difficulty, times of temptation, times of enemies standing in your way that you will not be holy can you still be holy for how many days for how many days are you planning to be holy all the days of your life the lord confirm it in your life in jesus name let's come back now to psalm 110 Psalm 110 was seen, point number one, the beginning of hope for God's willing people. Point number two now, the beauties of holiness in God's willing people. Look at that, look at that. It's in Psalm 110 and it's in verse 3. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. I'm one of the people of God. 
I said, I am one of the people of God. I am willing. I said, I am willing. Somebody there, I am willing. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness, in the beauties, plural, of holiness, from the womb of the morning, from the dawning of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. The beauties of holiness. You know what he's saying there? He's saying that holiness has many sides, composite sides. And all those sides of holiness, they shine forth like the sides of a prism of a diamond. And they're so beautiful. That's why he uses the plural, the beauties. Of holiness in our own way for us to remember all the various sides of these beaming beautiful dazzling holiness and it says when the people of God are willing then the beauties of holiness will shine forth in their lives Let's look at the composite parts. H, humility before God. And humility is beautiful in the sight of God. In fact, we're told in Scripture, He gives more grace to the humble, but He looks at the proud and He pushes them away from Himself. Micah chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 8, 6, 8, Micah. He has showed thee, O man, he has showed thee, O woman, what is good, and what does the Lord require of thee, but to walk, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. It's the very foundation of holiness, humility. It's humility that makes us to own up and to say we're not right before God. And we go to God in prayer. It's humility that makes us to confess, Oh Lord, this is what I've done in the past. Although I was religious, here is where I'd been. Here is what my life had been. It's humility that makes us to know we cannot save ourselves. Only Christ can save. And we yield our life to him and we're saved. It's humility that makes us to go back again to say, thank you for that salvation. But I still see something warring in my members. I still see something dragging me down. The old Adamic nature will not leave me alone. And then we consecrate and have sanctification. As an experience, he has showed thee, O man, O woman, what the Lord requires of thee, that you will do justly. You cannot do that without being justified. And love mercy. Love the mercy that the Lord is presenting to you. The mercy that gets us saved. And then you show that mercy to other people. And then to walk humbly with thy God. Humility before God. Oh, is obedience to his word. Obedience to his word. There's nothing as beautiful, graciously beautiful, wonderfully beautiful, eternally beautiful in the sight of God than a believer that walks in obedience to the word of God every time. The Lord cherishes that obedience. This obedience makes us unacceptable in the sight of God, ugly in the sight of God. He says, I don't look at the stature. I don't look at the outward expression. I look at the heart. It's looking for this component of holiness, obedience to the word. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, 
For Samuel chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 22. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, and Samuel said, As the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, obeying the voice of the Lord, and this is one of the evidences that you are born again. And when you are sanctified, the obedience goes deeper and higher and broader and greater. And whatever it is, the Lord is requesting of you joyfully and happily. There is obedience. It's the beauty of the Christian life in a child, in an adult, in a member, in a minister, in everyone, obedience to God, to the word of God, makes us beautiful, acceptable, precious in the sight of God. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken, to listen, and to heed than the fat of rams. El, living only by his word. Living only by his word. That's holiness. Because you had some opinions in the past. And when you jettison all those opinions and all the personal ideas, you brush them aside and you say there is only one thing. Only one thing that's important to me now. And I will live by that one unchanging standard of the word of God. Living only, only by his word. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 4. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's holiness. When you make up your mind that you're not going to listen to the words of society. You're not going to listen and gauge your life and live your life and model your life after the entertainers in the land. You're not going to model your life after all you see in the land. Only one thing will guide you. Only one thing will influence you. Only one thing will interest you. And you are going to live only by the word of God. That's holiness. And that's the beauty. Such a decision, such a determination, and such diligence to live only by his word. That's the component of holiness that is one of the beauties of holiness. I identifying with his cross. Identifying with his cross. Without the cross, Christ would not have been what he became. A savior, a sacrifice, a substitute, our shepherd, our all in all. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Oh, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Endured the cross. Without that, it will not fulfill the will of the Father. Endured the cross. Without that, he will not qualify to be our Savior. He endured the cross, despising the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You have a cross to bear identify with his cross. Luke chapter 9 verse 23. Luke chapter 9 verse 23. 
And he said to them all, everyone, and he said to them all, everyone, every one of us here, we come from different homes, we come from different localities, and everyone has a cross peculiar to where you are coming from. And that cross might stand in your way, not to fulfill the will of God, but as to identify with his cross. He says, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Take up his cross daily and follow me. And is neutralizing negative thoughts. It comes to everyone. Should I stay? Should I go? The thoughts will come. Should I continue? Should I stop? The thoughts will come. Can I go forward? Should I back? Slide? Go back? The thoughts might come to somebody there. Should I still carry this heavy load? Or do I drop it and become a runaway? The thought might come. But when you know the thoughts of Christ and the thoughts of God, and you abide in the thoughts of God to neutralize the thoughts of weak person, weak mind, that's part of holiness. You jettison, you throw off, you abandon your own thoughts, and you take the thoughts of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. You think often in a way different from the way God thinks. When there's a problem, your solution, what you think about, is different from what God is thinking about. And if every time you neutralize those negative thoughts with the thoughts of God, that's holiness. That's what makes you to live a holy life. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. That means you always bring into captivity every negative thought, every thought that says you cannot make it, you cannot do it. You bring all that into captivity. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Second Corinthians 10, verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's one component of holiness is beautiful. He is teeming his word, exalting his word. This one comes and he gives you advice to say, I will only do what the Lord has commanded. You exalt the word. That's a challenge in your life. And then people suggest this. And say, suggest that, and they suggest that. You say, but brethren, you have not even checked up what has God said in his word. How should I approach this matter in his word? Esteeming his word, exalting his word. Job chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 12, Job chapter 23, and we're reading from verse 12, neither have I gone back from the commandment 
of his lips. That's holiness. Everything I want to do, every challenge I have, every call I may have, I always check up on his commandment. And he says, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. That's beautiful in the sight of God. That's part of the components of the beauties of holiness. Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 127. 119, the psalm, the verse 127. In 127, the verse, therefore, I love thy commandment above gold. Above money, above foreign currency, above our national currency, yea. above fine gold verse 128 therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right And I hate every false way. I esteem your precept, your commandment, your word concerning everything. I don't say that's a small sin. I can use my peanut brain to think that out and to do whatever my peanut brain will tell me. I don't consult my likings i like this i like that and then because of that i double into this and double into that i consult the word of god and i esteem exalt the precept of the word of god concerning all things to be right humility before god obedience to his word Living only by his word, identifying with his cross, neutralizing negative thoughts, esteeming his word above every other idea or opinion, as sparing your own words. Sparing your own words, your own ideas your own thinking, your own utterances, and your own pride, I told so and so.
oh, this is what I will do. If this happens, this is what I will do. Now that thing has happened. And now, you think about it, what am I going to do? Can I swallow my words and go by the word of God? How does that affect me? my personality? How does that affect the self-esteem and my own personal promotion? Look at I say There, chapter 58, swallowing your own words, sparing your own words. I say, chapter 58, verse 13. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath, a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not honor yourself, not doing thy own ways, not finding thine own pleasure, look at this, not speaking thine own words. That's holiness we're discussing. This one's bringing an idea. I think, another one says, I feel, another one says, I propose, another one says, I contribute my own idea, and then it comes to you, you say, I am nothing, my opinion is nothing. My desires are nothing. The Lord of glory, he is the one that is important. I would rather spare my own words and then I look at the words. Of the Lord, not speaking thine own words. And when in the past, by pride, You had made a statement and you have said in your family, my wife, here is where I stand. I am the head of this house. If this happens, it has not happened. If this happens, this is what I will do. And because you're always watching for that negative thing to happen, now it has happened. If you're going to go to heaven, and if you're going to retain the beauties of holiness, what are you going to do now? You remember what you said before, but now, since you said that word, you have read the Bible, you have attended retreat, you have attended Bible study, and you have seen that what you said is contrary to the will of God and the word of God. If you are going to remain holy, what will you do? You will swallow your words. You will spare your own words. And the same thing in the family of God. You are a pastor, you are a leader. 
you are threatened. If this happens and you announce that over the microphone, everybody could hear. If this happens, this is what I will do. And everybody kept quiet. And that thing did not happen for some time. But now it happens. And you have just been reading the word of God. And you have seen that what you said, you said it in the flesh. What are you going to do now? Are you going to go ahead and say, I said it. Everybody heard me. And they are watching for what I will do now. If I don't do that, they will think now I am weak. It's better to be weak and get to heaven than to be strong-headed and strong-minded and go to hell. Holiness implies you will swallow your words if those words are not in agreement with the word of God. Spare your own words as seeking first the Lord in everything at all times. Seek him first, the Lord. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, here is what it says. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. The beauties of holiness. Humility before God, obedience to his word, living only by his word, identifying with his cross, neutralizing negative thoughts, esteeming his word, sparing your own words, seeking first the Lord. I pray those beauties of holiness will be in our lives. You are going to sleep. You are going to sleep. Yeah. Now you do me a favor. Will you? I said, will you do me a favor? Will you? Yeah. All these beauties of holiness will be in my personal life in Jesus' name. It will be in my life. All these beauties of holiness will be in your life permanently in Jesus' name. We shall all be holy. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties, plural, in the beauties of holiness from the womb, the dawn of the morning. Thou was the deal of thy youth. Point number three now. The breakthrough of honesty by God's willing people. Psalm 110. I'm reading from verse 4. The Lord has sworn I will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then he goes on to say, The Lord at the right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. Verse 7 He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. If the exaltation of Christ, the promotion of Christ, the ascension of Christ to the right hand of God the Father. If it has done anything for us, it has canceled the peculiarity of fallen Adam. And it has brought in the central habit and character of the very Son of God, the last Adam. It has given us this quality of character, honesty. Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 18. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 18. Pray for us 
but with trust, we have a good conscience. In all things, willing to live honestly. In all things, Christ has come in. And Christ has cleansed us. And Christ has taken away that old character of fallen Adam. And he has given us as a gift the new nature of Christ, the last Adam. And now we're willing in all things to live honestly. How? Look at verse 20. Now God, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his good will. Amen. Amen. Walking in you and walking in me, that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. It is that honesty that he implants in our heart that makes the word to be fruitful in our lives. Luke chapter 8, verse 15. Luke chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 15. It says, But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, you hear the word, and you receive it into an honest heart. It says, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. If you hear the word of God and you are not honest, you might just brush it aside, throw it over your shoulder, throw it to the person behind you there, throw it to your wife, throw it to your husband. And then you might look around here and there. I hope so and so is hearing this message. This message is for him. This message is for her. You don't have an honest heart. The word of God never reaches you, never touches you. It's always for that other person. If you have an honest heart and you hear the word of God, you say, that's true. I need change. I need transformation. I need a turning around. I need a touch from heaven on this area. You are honest enough to accept Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Is the character that the Lord has come to deepen in us. That our life with everyone, our behavior with everyone, our interaction with everyone takes in the quality of the nature of honesty in the life of Christ. Chapter 13, verse 13. Romans chapter 13, verse 13. Let us walk honestly. When no believers are there to see you, let us walk honestly. My sister, when your husband is not watching your office, let us walk honestly. My brother there, when your wife has traveled to go and see her parents, your in-laws, and you are the only one remaining in the house with the maid and with other people, let us walk honestly. When you are doing accounts, and uh, your company trusts you so much, you're a Christian, they never call in auditors. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting uh, and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife, not in uh, envying. And then uh, in uh, verse 14, uh, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Second Corinthians chapter 8, 
Verse 21, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're reading from verse 21. Providing for honest things. Providing for honest things. Are you going to do retreat in your locality? Are you doing workers meeting in your locality? And then you are told to make a budget. This number of people are likely to come. And we need to feed them. And you are making the budget. Providing for honest things. Not increasing. Not making the budget elastic. Not adding things there. That is for your private personal pocket. Providing for honest things. Not only in the sight of the Lord. But also in the sight of God men. Chapter 13 of 2 Corinthians verse 7. 2 Corinthians verse 7. Now I pray to God that she do no evil. Not that we should appear approved. We're not looking for commendation, recommendation, but that we should do that which is honest. We should do that which is honest. Every time the words of your mouth, the action of your hand, the very fact that Christ has gone to sit on the right hand of majesty on high and he has brought you into the kingdom, that we do that which is honest. Verse 8 for we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Be honest. That the teaching of the word of God, the doctrine of the word of God, the ancient landmarks, and the things committed unto us, delivered unto us by the saints that have gone by in the whole Bible, that we do nothing against the truth. But we abide in the truth. You will in Jesus' name. First Thessalonians chapter 4. In First Thessalonians chapter 4, reading from verse 11. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. And that she study to be quiet. Don't be noisy. Don't be flippant. Don't be frivolous. Don't be a clown that she is told thee to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Verse 12, that she may walk honestly toward them that are outside, that are without, and those who are inside too, and that she may have lack of nothing. For Peter, Chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 12. First Peter chapter 2, verse 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. You know Gentiles, unbelievers, unbelieving men. You know the dirty jokes, they crack, but your conversation is honest. You go to barb your hair. And in the barber's shop, you know the kind of stories they tell? And the jokes, they crack. And the foolish things, they say. That your own conversation there in the barber's shop will be honest. As you go to the saloon to make your ear and to tidy up your ear, sisters, you know how they joke, what they talk about? You know their vocabulary, you know what they say. But you are a child of God, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evil doers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Did I hear any amen? The Lord implanting your life all this quality 
of honesty in Jesus' name. Now before we pray, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, don't ever get involved with any dishonest business, dishonest administration, dishonest policy, dishonest action, dishonest behavior. Brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And as you do that, as you obey the word of God, the God of peace shall be with you. The God of power shall be with you. The God of all possibilities shall be with you. From now on to the rest of your life, in Jesus' name. The Lord will strengthen you. The Lord will empower you. And the Lord will make you to fulfill all he has planned for your life, in Jesus' name. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Are there willing people there tonight? I said that there are willing people there tonight. The people of God will be willing to pray. The people of God will be willing to do the will of God. The people of God will be willing to have more grace, abundant grace in their lives. That thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, thou.